Morning, Midway Church. So glad that you have joined us today, either in the house or online. We are so glad that you're with us. We got a humongous day to talk about. I'm Leslie, and this is Pastor Luke, excuse me, Dr. Pastor Luke Hughes. Oh, yikes. Yes, (laughs) exactly. Uh He says no. (laughs) That's right. Well, it's already been an exciting day so far. So if you're just joining us, you've jumped into a party and you don't even know it. It is a party. So what, have you put, been, what, is, what have you been up to listen, this morning? Listen, well, I was a little bit late coming on because I was doing some baptism counseling, which was super exciting on this day, which is a baptism Sunday. If you're online and in the house, I hope you brought your swimmies. Maybe an impromptu baptism or a scheduled baptism. There may we be two several. or three. Yeah, there's um, eight baptisms that are scheduled. And then, of course, surprise, you're going to have an opportunity to get baptized today if you would like. How this about that? Is, Amazing. You know, it's a great day. <laughs> I've got my swimmies on. We should have actually wore swimmies. That would have been very good for the theme. Yes. <laughs> it yes. would have been perfect. Hawaiian shirt. Hawaiian legs, shirt, you know, all the things, and swimmies. For swimmies the bab- on my arms. For the baptism. Yes. How you mm-hmm. how you going? Are you doing okay? I'm doing good. Yeah, That's I'm good. excited. It's, you know, great things. You know, look at God today. How, I know. Look, ain't good. As Micah says, ain't he good? Yeah. <laughs> He is. He is. I know that you guys are glad to see Luke back as well. because And Luke just kind of hangs around the back because people have been wanting to see you. I always get, hey, where's Luke? I'd like to see Luke. Luke's hanging around in the back and avoiding some crowds. So here yes, we are. Yes. Less expl- exposure. Yes. 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 And so it's uh, it's been good. It's been great to be back and just uh, hanging out and, you know, work well, in with like, you. And, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm glad you're back. An exciting time, obviously, even with just so many things going on. But uh, just so you know, really quick with announcements, we have uh, graduation Sunday coming up. And uh, the reason we're telling you about that now, it's actually May 5th, but uh, we have to uh, you have to register for graduation, whether you're a senior or you're graduating college or a master's degree or anything like that. Um, and uh, that will be April 28th <laughs> is the last day you can register. So you can go online and register for that individually, each person, and you'll be good to go. We want to celebrate you and that accomplishment, that hard work. So... Excuse you know. me, I know you're standing in the room. Charlie, he did not, and Charlie's standing in the room too. Charlie, he didn't mention himself. And if you got a doctorate degree, I think that we should start right now like a poll uh-huh. on whether Luke should walk across the stage with everybody else, don't yeah. you think? Well, you wear that, what, that little beret thing or whatever, the <laughs> circle hat. I vote. Know? I vote that mm-hmm. Luke goes. Yes. Luke got his doctorate. I vote that he goes for graduation mm-hmm. Sunday. Yep. Okay, so you got to go ahead and register for that. April 28th, and you'll be hearing about it over in the youth and, and all the different places. Then we have child dedication. Let's yeah. go. Which is a special Sunday where special. these new parents are newer parents. Some of you may uh, already be seasoned in that regard. And it's uh, a yeah, seasoned parent. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, he's second, third <laughs> kid. You know, you're still dedicating them. You're not like, oh, I'm done with this one. But uh, oh, so... I'm done with this whole process. <laughs> Number four, you're yeah, not getting dedicated. No, you're not getting you know, dedicated. Yeah, you're still getting dedicated. Yes, yes. you are. You did but get out of it. the reason uh, we are telling you about that now, again, that's May 12th, is you have to go through a kind of like little informational class and celebration where they kind of explain the importance of child dedication. And to sign up for that class, you have to sign up by April 24th. So same deal. You go to the website, go under events, and you can sign up for child dedication. And that's very close 
So make sure that you sign up for child dedication. And the class is good. It's very informative. It's it's why we do the things we do through child dedication. That's what yeah. you'll yeah. that's what you'll learn in the class. Yeah. Well, and it's a little bit different than like normal stuff, right? Because there are other church traditions that do different yes. things with children, and so you'll kind of just learn the distinctives of what uh, Midway is about in helping your family move with God throughout all the years that you guys are developing and sending kids off to better futures, hopefully. So. Better futures. Yep. Well, listen, it's going to be an incredible day at Midway Church. It already has been. And so this hour is going to be amazing as well. So hang out with Luke and I and worship together here at Midway Church. It's going to be great.
Great to see everybody. How are we doing this morning? All right, you guys look great. It's been an incredible morning so far. Uh, today looks a little different for us, okay? It's Baptism Sunday. Um, as of right now, there's over 20 people that are being baptized today. We saw uh, so many in first service, and uh, yeah, you can celebrate that. We're believing that for this service as well. So it's exciting. So we're going to just do another song here in a minute, and then we're going to go ahead and hear from Pastor Kevin today. And uh, the prayer this morning is the response to that. Um, and and, and that, that could be you this morning to respond to baptism. So we, we believe that. We've been preparing for that. We're excited. Um, we're going to go ahead and push at this a little early, but if you're a partner with us, the ways to give are on the screen. It is for moments just like we're about to experience where God is moving in Philippians. It says to be known by love, and that's what Midway wants to be known by, is love and through our actions. And so uh, thank you for being a part of that and what's happening. And if you look in the, the back of your chair, there's a little card. Uh, maybe you've considered hopping in a life group or what's the next step? Am, am I gonna be serving? You can fill that card out uh, at the end of service, drop it on stage or one of the boxes or any guest services people, and uh, we'll get that connected, get you connected. It's gonna be good. All right, let's be your friendly church. Say hello to someone near you.
Good morning, Midway. So good to see all of you here. Great looking group here in the house. Welcome to all of you tuning in all over the place. It's been an amazing day already. And I know some of you are thinking, why are you here so early? Where's the rest of the music? Uh, and it's coming. We've well, got a little bit of a different day today. It's baptism day. Every Sunday at Midway, we're so blessed. Just about every Sunday, people are being baptized at Midway Church. It's just a part of who we are, what we get to see as God is changing lives. But every now and then, a couple of times a year, we just like to make a special emphasis on baptism. And that's why I got my shirt on. All things new is what it says. It comes from 2 Corinthians 5, 17. God makes us a new creation. Uh, and that's what we see symbolized in baptism. And I'll be up front. All cards on the table. Today, there are several people. We've got, as Kyle mentioned, some 20 plus people that are going to be baptized. Uh, we've got uh, eight or so scheduled in this service uh, already. But then some of you are still uh, going to respond even today uh, to baptism. And what I mean by that is, guess what? Some of you are like, well, I don't have clothes. We got it all. We got underwear, we got shirts, we got shorts. We just got everything covered. So no excuses. Maybe God's going to stir that in you. Either to take that step today, we're ready for you, or to take a step forward and say, I'm ready to have that conversation, nail it down, and schedule it for the future. We love baptism day. Because what these moments do is they help us work through even things like doubt. That's the series we're in, Deconstructing Doubt. There's this movement today that is often called deconstructionism. It's where people, literally the, the word itself means to strip away, to get to the core, to tear down the layers, to examine something. And I'm going to tell you, God is for that word. God wants you to examine why you believe what you believe. He wants you to examine his word. But what the enemy has turned into this shift from deconstructionism to deconversion, where people are saying, well, I no longer believe, is something that going, going back to deconstruction, God wanted to meet you there. I firmly believe it about every person to say, as you look for truth, you will find Jesus. And so that which we say turns into deconversion, actually God meant to help you get to this place where you can own own your own faith. God doesn't want you to have faith because grandma told you to, or your parents told you to. I tell you all the time, don't take my word for it. As your pastor, don't just do something and believe something because I said it. Read it for yourself. You got the same Bible, the same connection to God. When you pray, he listens the exact same way that I, when I pray. God wants to hear from you and meet you where you are. That's why we're doing this series. We've called it Deconstructing Doubt because if I'm going to get to the core of my faith and own my faith, that means i got to walk through doubt. It can be like the waves of the sea, but God's ready to be your steady horizon when we face those waves. So today, the best thing I can offer you, I'm going to do my invitation first in some ways. One of the invitations when it comes to doubt is find a life group. That's the best thing I could offer you as your pastor to wrestle with your doubt. This is a great starting place. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> but I hope you won't just stay in rows. I hope you'll find a circle. That's why we have life groups. That's also why I would tell you today, if you're watching online, you can go to midwaychurch.com slash life groups. You can sign up for one. If you're here in the room, you can do that too. Or there's a table out here on the way towards the atrium. To my left, to your right, you can visit them. We want you to find a life group. That's challenge number one. Number two, some of y'all have been hiding. I told you that last week. Here's who it is. It's those who need to lead a life group. We're growing so much. We got to have 15 plus new life groups by this fall just to have a room, have space for everybody in homes. We got co-leaders. We got processes to equip you. If you're ready to go on that journey, go to that same table. Go to that same link right now and we will create more spaces where, listen, you can wrestle with your down. That's who Midway Church is. You bring who you are. God will meet you there. With that, I want to take us into today's focus, and it is doubting salvation. Last week, I just looked at dealing with doubt from the Great Commission, and if you missed that message, you can go to midwaychurch.com, our app, YouTube, all those different places, and find that message. Encourage you to do so, but even if today's your only day with us right now, and it's the first time here, we're glad you're here. I believe God's going to meet you in what is a divine appointment. Doubting salvation. If you got your Bibles, you can go on and make your way to Matthew chapter 11. This is about John the Baptist. John the Baptizer is who he is. What a fitting person to study in Scripture for Baptism Sunday for us. John the Baptizer. You can meet me there. John had doubts too. I have doubts too. We all doubt. We've nailed down at least three common denominators of our doubt. It's either tough questions or it's just like, well, I just can't seem to figure out 
uh, this hard question in my life, this thing I see in scripture perhaps. So maybe it's tough questions. Maybe you have doubts because of tough circumstances, a loss, a tragedy, grief in your life. Maybe it's time for you today to say, you know what, those tough questions that come from the tough circumstances are met with my number three, human capacity. Sometimes our human capacity, our little pea brains. You feel insulted yet? But it's true. Compared to God, his ways are not my ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. I can't comprehend God to the fullest because I'm just a human right now. But oh, there's coming a day I will. I'll be with him. I'll be made like him. But until then, our human capacity coupled with tough questions and tough circumstances is going to bring about some doubt. And all God's people said, because we're all in the same boat together. That's why we're digging into this series. And here's what we believe at Midway Church. I shared it with you last week. It's the heartbeat of this series is this, that the church should be the safest place in the world to deal with doubt. That wasn't our idea. That's how Jesus dealt with doubt. And you're going to see it again in today's passage. And that, my friends, is who Midway Church is. You bring whoever you are, all that you bring with you to Midway. We'll love you, meet you where you are. Why? Because that is what Jesus always does. And I'm glad of that. I doubted salvation in the church. My greatest experiences in all my life have been in the church. <laughs> my worst experiences in all my life have been in the church. Sometimes when you bring your doubt to church, it's met the right way, the way Jesus would, the way we want to build a culture to be here at Midway. But sometimes it's met with skepticism or shunning or even kicking you out because of doubt. Maybe you've been kicked out because of doubt. Not so here. I doubt his salvation. Can it really be true that God would save somebody like me? Does God really still love me even after I, you fill in the blank? Can I lose my salvation? How do I know for sure that I really had it to begin with? Those are questions I wrestled with, and I'm going to give you a bottom line answer that God has helped me build a life on at the front end of this sermon, and then we'll unpack it together by looking at John the baptizer and his doubts, because he had them too. Here's what God brought me to. The more I sought truth, the more I found Jesus. But here's how God met me in my doubt, is that my assurance of salvation is not found in my perfection. It's not found in perfect circumstances. It's not found in a perfect church. It's not found in me being perfect. It's not found in me getting all these things cleaned up. It's not found in salvation still feeling the same that it used to feel. That's what I ran into. At one point when I was saved as a child and baptized, it, man, I felt it. The emotions were high, but then life happened and I had to own my faith through all these tough questions and I started questioning all of it. I questioned God, I questioned myself, I questioned his call in my life, even as I became a pastor way later, but particularly in my high school years, I questioned all of those things. But God showed me, my assurance of salvation is not found in my perfection. Nothing I bring to the table. My assurance is not found in my perfection. My assurance of salvation is found in God's pull. Not in my perfection, but in God's pull. Here's what I mean. When I doubt, God pulls me close to know him more. When I doubt, God pulls me close so that I can see who I am to him more. When I doubt and when I misstep and when I sin and when the hurts and habits and hangups of my life creep up on me, then God pulls me close. He doesn't push me away. He pulls me to his truth. The Holy Spirit convicts and reminds me of what is true when Satan is filling me with lies. So, and that, my friends, if you're even doubting and wrestling, that alone is a good sign that God has saved you and you're a part of God's family, or at least that he's asking you to be and it's time to respond to him. Wherever you're at in either of those cases, God's going to meet you where you're at today. Your assurance of salvation is not in your perfection or perfect feelings and circumstances, the goosebumps of the worship song. No, your assurance of salvation is found in God's pull to his truth and to his heart to remind you who you are and whose you are. I live in that truth today, not because of me, but because God met me in my doubts. I believe he's ready to do that in yours. Because here's the truth. There are things in your life that you didn't think would turn out this way. Following Jesus, sometimes we think it just looks like, well, everything's going to look like as I pictured it. And I'll have the church smile, but it won't even be a church smile. It'd be a real smile. It's just going to line up. But John found out, I found out, maybe you did too, that there are going to be times where life doesn't look like I pictured. And sometimes when things don't turn out the way you thought they would or believed they should, 
that's when God wants to work in you the most, but they can lead you down this road of doubt and deconstruction in the wrong direction. But John lived that out. His story is one that's appropriate for baptism Sunday, but it's very appropriate for doubt because through his story, Matthew 11, the first six verses is what we're gonna read. We're gonna see two very simple things that we learn from John's story that give us two things we can do when we have doubt. Very simple. Let's look at those two together. If you're ready for the word today, give somebody a high five or fist bump. Let's dig in. Together, Matthew chapter 11, the first of the two action steps in times of doubt we learn from John comes from the first three verses. The word of God says, Matthew 11, 1, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. That's a whole sermon, how Jesus never got deterred from his mission, no matter what. But I'm not preaching that one today, but just know, Jesus is always on mission. We should be too. Verse two, now when John heard in prison, about the deeds of the Christ, two things about his context there. He sent word by his disciples and said to him, he sent his disciples, his messengers to Jesus, verse three, and he said to Jesus through them, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Number one, what do we do when we doubt? Same thing John did, bring your doubt to Jesus. Number one, bring your doubt to Jesus. The most simple thing you'll hear all day is maybe the most profound change that you've been looking for in your life. Bring your doubt to Jesus. Let me ask you a question. If you could send messengers to Jesus, knowing Jesus would send messengers back to you, and you could ask him one question, what question would you ask Jesus? Just think about that for a moment. You know what John's was? Are you really the one? Scholars debate, was he just doing this for his messengers, for his disciples? I don't know, maybe. But this guy, listen, here's where he's, what's going on in John's life. He has spoken truth to an evil King Herod. And he's been thrown in prison because he spoke truth to an evil king. He has been in prison for about a year now. Why don't you think about that? About a year just for speaking truth, for preaching Jesus. He's Jesus' cousin. We're going to look at that here in just a second. But because he spoke truth, he's in prison. He's awaiting his head being cut off. He knows it's coming. I'd probably doubt a little too. Do you think he had a moment where he went, I didn't sign up for this? Being the guy to prepare the way for Jesus, he's the one, John 1, that said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he said, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. And he got his name John the baptizer because he said, repent and be baptized and follow him, pointed at Jesus. He's the cousin of Jesus. When he was in his mother's womb, Mary, mother of Jesus, while carrying Jesus, came to see Elizabeth. And in his mother's womb, he knew Jesus. How do we know? It says he leapt in his mother's womb just when Jesus showed up in his mother's womb. That John had doubts. I don't know whether to feel discouraged about that or encouraged about that sometimes. But I feel both. I'm encouraged that like, man, even John the baptizer had doubts like this. And discouraged that like, man, if he doubted, I don't stand a chance. How about you? I'm just being real with y'all. That's what happens when I read it. But then I read further. And Jesus responds to him in his doubt. He brings his doubt to Jesus, are you really the one? He heard in two places, part of the context of his story. Number one, in prison, in prison. He had those doubts. He asked that question, in prison, in prison. He was in a physical prison, locked away for about a year at this point. But I wonder, what's your prison? Because I think the worst prisons in life are often not the visible prisons. The worst prisons in life are often the prisons of the mind, prisons of the heart, things that you carry, the doubts, the despair, the agony, the grief, the tragedy you went through, the questions that you have because of that, your human capacity trying to grasp those things. The devil wants to use all of that to destroy your faith and make it a prison in your life. So what, my friend, is your prison? You may not have bars like John's, but I bet you got one. The enemy wants to lock you in one, that's for sure. In prison, he had doubts. Second thing, when he saw the deeds of the Christ, the deeds of the Christ, when he saw what Jesus was doing, what does that mean? What's the context there? I'd ask you, what didn't turn out the way you thought it should turn out? What didn't God do that you thought he should do? What did God do that you thought he shouldn't do? <laughs> what questions do you have about the deeds of God? 
Well, I never dreamed. John would have thought, I never dreamed I'd be in prison. I thought I had more preaching fire left in my belly. It wasn't supposed to be this way. Do you ever feel that way? It wasn't supposed to be. How did I end up here? And it makes us down in prison as he sees the way God is working. Or maybe he doesn't see the way God is working. Maybe that is something you can relate with. I'm going to be real with you and share something that I don't want to preach because I know as soon as I preach it, God's going to give me more opportunities to live it out. But I'm going to say it anyway because this is what God said to say. I have learned in my own journey that one of the greatest ways God grows my faith is by not meeting my expectations. <laughs> I don't like that very much, but there you go. I said it, Lord. I, I did what you said. By not meeting my expectations. It's, listen, so many times, too much of my life is spent in the prison of what I thought God should do. You ever have those moments like, God, well, God, if I were God, like, y'all should be glad I'm not God. You think the world's a mess now? <laughs> God, if I were you, but God stretches my faith when he doesn't meet my expectations, but he doesn't want me to live in the prison of my unmet expectations. He doesn't want me to live in the prison of how God, the deeds of Christ, don't look like I thought they should or what I believed they would. He doesn't want me to live in a prison at all. He wants me to be free. Here's what you can know about disappointment, discouragement, and doubt. God wants to use those things. Don't miss this. God wants to use your doubt, your discouragement, your despair. God wants to use doubt to develop your faith. The devil wants to use your doubt, your discouragement, your despair, your disappointment to destroy your faith. God takes doubt and he wants to develop faith. The devil takes doubt and he wants to destroy your faith. So two sentences that summarize all of that is this. Doubt is inevitable, but development is optional. Doubt's going to happen. God wants to take your doubt and turn it into development, stretching, building of your faith and your journey and walk with him. The devil wants to take that development and make it destruction. So the development part is something you've got to choose. It's something you've got to lean into as you have your doubts. They're inevitable, but what God wants to do is something you've got to choose to lean into. As I look at my own journey, I've learned that God doesn't conform to my agenda, but he always wants to conform me to his agenda. And so today, I pray this over you. I want you to know today, friend, God wants to set you free from what you thought would be. I want to say that again, because that'll preach. God wants to set you free from what you thought it would be, should be, could be. How did I end up here? God wants to set you free from the prison of wondering those things. He wants you to walk in freedom. Even though you've got doubts, he doesn't want them to become a prison. What do we do with them? Number one. Bring your doubts to Jesus. Let's go to number two, coming from verses four through six. This is how Jesus responds to the doubts of John. Verse four, and Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. Verse five, the blind receive their sight and the lame walk, lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. Verse six, and blessed is the one who is not offended, my version says. Underline that in yours. I'm going to come back there. It's an important word. Blessed is the one, he's saying to John, who is not offended by me. What does that mean? Glad you asked. Let's unpack it together. Number two is this. Bring your doubt to Jesus. Number two is receive God's reassurance. Jesus could have said, John, you're my cousin. You prepared the way for me. You're in prison. I'm done with you. If you still doubt and you're still asking me that question, I'm done. I'm going to stay on mission. Well, John was his mission. He was part of his mission, and he reassured John in his doubts. And look at me for a minute. He wants to reassure you in yours today, too. God wants you to have assurance today. Here's how John saw it broken apart by Jesus. The answers Jesus gives back is none of what John expected. None of what John expected. He wanted some clear answers. And it's like, you're talking about, I already knew you were doing those things. John's been in prison for a year. He's been hearing secondhand reports about the healings and the ministries of Jesus. And now Jesus is just telling about the healings and the ministry of Jesus that he was just hearing about. Like, what are you doing to me, Jesus? Think about if you're John. But there's a deeper message. And John, I believe, fully got this message. He gave his life for this message. His head would be chopped off, by the way. <laughs> Not quite what he signed up for, wouldn't you think? 
Christianity is not some little bubble that God calls us to. If you're looking for something safe, you better stay away from following after Jesus. It ain't safe, but man, there's no better place to be and no safer ending to the story than following after Jesus. John got that. John expected Jesus to burn down Rome. The Messiah was supposed to come. Jewish, saw, Jewish people saw him as he was the guy who would come and make everything right. He would end the oppression of this evil Roman empire. So in his mind, the Messiah is going to come. He's going to build this revolt, and he's going to burn down Rome. Yeah. Ugh. And then Jesus is healing people, and it's like, okay, it's a good start. When's the army coming? Where's my sword? Oh, no sword. Oh, you don't want a sword. Oh. You're going to heal somebody else. Oh, again. And now I'm going to go to prison because you're healing people and I'm telling people you're the one. And now I'm kind of starting to doubt if you're really the one. And now I'm, I'm going to have my head chopped off for this fate. I, didn't, I don't think I signed up for this. That's where John's living. Can you imagine? Maybe that's where you live. John expected Jesus to burn down Rome, but Jesus came to build a bigger kingdom. And that is exactly what he was building. He's, John would say the kingdom of heaven is at hand, but it didn't look like the way he thought it would look. Maybe your kingdom, the way God is building his kingdom in your life, doesn't look like what you thought it would look like. But I want you to know today that God is building a bigger kingdom. It's way bigger than you can see. It's way bigger than you can grasp. That's what Jesus reassured John of with three things. I want to point them out to you today. He's building a bigger kingdom. So Jesus pointed to three things. You want to know what they are? Number one. He pointed to his work. I'm going to tell you anyway. He pointed to his work. He said, here's the things I'm doing. Now, here's the difference in you and me and John. John didn't have the benefit of looking at Jesus' work from hindsight. At this point, Jesus hasn't died. He hasn't been buried. He hasn't been raised from the dead. He hasn't taken that step just yet. John was preparing the way for Jesus. And then in his doubt, saying, are you really the one? Or are you just paving the way for him? Because I'm kind of not totally, maybe totally sure. In this moment, Jesus said, look at the work I'm doing. John had to look at it anticipating what would happen with the work. Here's the good part. For you and for me, you know what we get to do? We get to look at it as the finished work of Jesus. He said from the cross, it is finished. To Telestai. It means paid in full. It is complete. He accomplished his purpose. And so what Jesus is pointing John to, and John can't even grasp all of this just yet, but we get to read about it in Matthew chapter 11 in Matthew's gospel because he wants you today to know that when you have doubts, Jesus points you back to the finished work of Jesus. It is finished. He paid your debt in full. And Jesus points to the work he's doing at that time. We get to look at it now in hindsight. With each of these, I'll give you a quick look at another scripture verse that supports it. But I'll tell you, friends, one of the greatest doubt deterrents in my life is remembering God's faithfulness, is looking at the finished work of Jesus and what it has looked like in my own life and journey. It's a great doubt deterrent. Colossians 2, if you don't believe me, let me show you Paul's writing. Colossians 2, verse 13 I love these passages. 2.13 says, and you who were what? Dead. That's a bad place to be. I'm glad verse 13 doesn't stop there. You were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. That's pretty good, but let's look at verse 14. And then he says, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. It is finished. Jesus is pointing John, and he's pointing you to the finished work of Jesus. And if you doubt salvation, can I really know I'm saved? Can I know for sure I'm not going to lose it? These verses will help you a lot. But here's how I look at it in a statement for you today. If I can't earn salvation, I can't lose it either. If I don't have the power to earn it, listen, I'm saved by grace through faith, not of works, or then I would be all boastful about it. It's how Paul says it, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. I can't save myself. I can't earn. I don't have the power to gain salvation. So what in the world would make me think I can lose it? I don't have the power to get it, so I don't have the power to lose it. And I'm going to show you deeper how Jesus spoke directly into this idea of losing your salvation. But here's what you should know. You need to know that you have it. And if you don't, God wants you to know that you know, that you know, that you know that you know. 
And I can tell you how today. Not because I'm here, but because God wants to meet you there. If I can't earn it, I can't lose it. God keeps me. He gives it to me. He keeps me. Jesus points us to his work. Number two, he points us to his word. Jesus pointed to his work. He said, look at these things I'm doing. Then he pointed to his word. As he pointed to that list of things, he said, the blind receive sight, verses four through six, Matthew 11. The deaf can hear. The poor receive the good news. You know where that comes from? It comes from Isaiah, the prophet. It's in your Bible. You can check it. Again, don't take my word for it. Go read it. Isaiah 61. For all you scholars out there, go dig in. And Isaiah said, this Messiah who would come, here's what he's going to do, the work was recorded in the word. Jesus is saying to John, you've heard me preach on these things. These are prophecies. Isaiah wrote these down over 700 years before Jesus was even born. And Jesus is saying, I'm not only doing the work that Isaiah wrote about, I'm the one that's described there. I'm fulfilling prophecy and I'm doing it all of these years later and I'm doing it for you. Jesus pointed to his work and he pointed to the word. Isaiah 61 is where it was recorded. You can go to Luke chapter four. When Jesus went to his hometown of Nazareth, this is where he said, the prophet's not welcome in his hometown. Luke chapter four, you can read it there. Luke chapter four. He reads in the temple there in his hometown from the scroll of Isaiah. And guess where he read from? Isaiah 61. It wasn't Isaiah 61 because they didn't have chapters and verses like us because we, we were in America. We like it easy and simple and we try to make it easy to follow. That's where your numbers came from. Do you know, it was a scroll. It was just text. And so he read from the scroll of Isaiah. We've added the chapters and verses so we can know where to turn to. And he read from Isaiah 61 where it says that this Messiah who would come, that the blind will receive sight, that the deaf will hear, that the that the captives will be set free, that the poor will receive good news. There's this list. It's the same list that Jesus sends back to John. He pointed to his work because his work was in the word and it was a prophecy recorded about him. You want assurance in your life. Look at the finished work of Jesus and look at the fulfilled prophecy recorded in his word. Why is fulfilled prophecy matter so much? Because when we see prophecies fulfilled, we know that God's promises are true. And when we know God's promises are true, we know that we can trust God even when we have doubts. Jesus pointed to his work as it was recorded in the word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So when Jesus pointed to his work and to his word, he's really pointing to himself. He's the word. And I'm so glad he came. He came for you. He thought of these moments when he did. Ephesians 1 13 and 14. If you're doubting your salvation, here's what God's word would say to you today. He pointed to the word. I'll do the same. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him. So it assumes that you heard the word of truth, you heard the gospel and you believed. Look at me for a second. Some of you are wrestling with salvation. You're not wrestling with whether you can lose it. You're wrestling with whether or not you can even have it. It really is that simple. You hear and you believe straight from the word of God. But if that's the case, what do we know about that? If that happens with us, we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And all God's people said, as if that's not enough, here's my favorite assurance of salvation scripture. Jesus is talking in John chapter 10 about his sheep. He says, my sheep, they hear my voice. They know me and I know them. And he says this, verses 28 and 29, John 10, Jesus says, I give them eternal life. Wait a minute. Who does it? You do it. Who's the I? Jesus. I just want to be real clear. We bring nothing to the table. Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And as if that's not enough, go to verse 29. He continues and says this, verse 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one. Who is it again? No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Sounds pretty final if you ask me. Sounds like it is finished if you ask me. Jesus pointed to his work. Jesus pointed to his word. And oh, let's make it personal. He didn't stop there. Verse six, Jesus pointed to his will. He pointed to his work. He pointed to the word. He pointed to his will. It's God's will, friend, that you know that you have eternal life. That's God's will for you. He wants you to know that you know that you know. He said to John, he said, tell John I'm doing work. <laughs> and then he said, tell John I'm fulfilling prophecy. And then he said, tell John, don't trip over his doubts. 
let me prove it to you. Verse six, remember I told you to underline a word. What was that word again? I forget. Oh yeah, offended, that one. You know what, it, it's one of those words that in the English language, we can barely create enough words to describe the Greek language that this was originally written in. The Greek word is scandalon. And that Greek word literally physically means like a snare or a tripping block or a stumbling block or something that causes stumbling, tripping, or error. It gives this imagery of something here that I go, y'all thought you're awake now, aren't you? <laughs> it gives this imagery of tripping over things. And so what is he literally saying to John? He's saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the Messiah. Look at my work. My work is fulfilling the word. I am the word. Now my will for you is that you are not offended. You're not tripped up. You're not stumbling over your doubts. Just like you leapt in the womb when you were in your mother's womb and I was in my mother's womb. Leap. Jump over the doubts. Keep moving through the doubts. Don't trip over your doubts. Doubts don't have to be a prison, my friend. And write it down this way. Doubts don't have to be a dead end. Your doubt doesn't have to be a dead end. That is what he was telling John. He pointed to his work and his word so that John could know his will, that he wouldn't be stumbling. So what does that mean for us today in modern English language? Don't be tripping over your doubts. Stop tripping. You're going to have them. Step over those things. We don't walk to the valley of the shadow of death. We walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And he says to John, don't trip. How many of you this last week saw the eclipse? I can't even see y'all. Some of you guys are so tired of talking about the eclipse. If that's you, I, I promise it'll only take me a minute. But if the rest of you who are really excited about it, I just love, I love God's creation. We were out there, we were having staff meetings. We were, going, we were stopping like, hold on, let's go see. And we go out and we get our glasses on and we go look at the sky. And what I saw was amazing because the rocks cry out. The heavens declare the glory of God. So bear with me for those of you who didn't see that in the eclipse and you're just tired of it dominating everything in your life. Here's what I saw. I saw that the sun was blocked. I saw that it became this eerie, dreary darkness around me. I even felt the temperature cool. Did y'all see that? It's pretty crazy. Just in a minute. The bright sun that illuminated that day in the morning and through lunchtime, I didn't see it anymore. I couldn't feel it. I mean, it felt weird. I didn't like how it felt. Actually, I was like, man, bring it back. Bring the sun back. I was like, these glasses, I don't want them anymore. Bring it back. The temperature that once was, it dropped. Things didn't feel like they used to feel when the sun was visible and I felt its rays on my face. But then it, I realized this is exactly like doubting salvation. One time it felt bright. I felt the rays of God's sunlight on my face and then came life and it came like a freight train. And it hit me dead on. And now the rays of sunshine, the emotions I felt with salvation, I don't feel them. The temperature is dropped. Everything is different. I don't see the light like I used to see the light. But then it hit me. And oh, this will preach. This will meet you in your doubts today, my friends. Is even though the sun was blocked, even though the light dimmed, even though the temperature was lower, the sun never stopped shining. And the light of Jesus through your doubts, even when you don't feel saved, even when you don't know if God could still be good, even when the temperature of life drops so much you can't see the light of day, the light of Jesus is still shining. And you don't even need glasses to see it. He'll meet you right where you are. It doesn't have to be a dead end in your life. It is God's will that you know. 1 John 5, 13, John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may what? know that you have eternal life. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. Do you not know? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized? Now, this is not yet talking about a physical water baptism yet. This word is put into. You've been put into Christ. 
You're put into his family. That's where the imagery of water comes next. I'll tell you about that in just a moment. He says, do you not know that all of us who have been put into, baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized, put into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him. All things are new, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I'm a new creation here. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. That's what God wants you to do. That's why we're baptized. But let's talk about salvation first. I want you to know, friends, salvation is received, not achieved. Salvation is received. It's a gift of God. It's not achieved. There again, if I can't achieve it, I can't lose it. He locks me into his family. I'm put into his family, and nothing can snatch me from my father's hands. Salvation is not some cosmic escape plan that gets me out of things in the future. Boy, it gives me eternal life then, but listen, salvation changes everything in the right now. It changes everything today, right where I sit. It changes me and gives me life to the fullest now. God's the great I am, not the great I was, not the great I will be. He's always been the great I am in the past. He is the great I am in the present. He will be the great I am in the future. And salvation meets me in my I am moments. I am bruised. I am broken. I am doubting. I am humiliated. I am full of shame. I am full of doubt and confusion and despair and anxiety. And God says, I am all you've been looking for. We walk in that newness of life. That's why we're baptized. I'm put into the water because I'm put into the family of God. I'm put into the water because I'm put into Christ. He adopts me. Walk in that. I'm not baptized to be saved. I'm baptized because I'm saved. That's baptism Sunday. Romans 6 is where we get some of the language. When we baptize people, we say buried with Christ in baptism. Romans 6, 3 and 4. Raised to walk with him in the newness of life. Romans 6, 4. That's where that comes from. So today for baptism Sunday, I'm going to give you a chance to receive Jesus. But some of you need to be baptized. Eight or so of you are already scheduled. You're going to come in a moment. we got counselors ready to talk to those of you who aren't. But first things first, you need to accept Jesus. And once you do, I want to answer this question. Why should I be baptized? Why? Four reasons. Number one. Because Jesus was. Matthew 3, 13 to 17, Jesus was baptized. Because Jesus was. That's reason number one. Jesus was baptized. It means to be immersed, put under, put into, because Jesus was. Then number two, because Jesus commanded it. Matthew 28, 16 to 20. We looked at it last week. This is why not just pastors have the privilege of baptizing. Jesus gave the Great Commission to believers. And he gave it to believers. And he said, go and make disciples baptizing and teaching. And so that's what you're about to see in just a moment. Because Jesus was. Because Jesus commanded it. Here's where it gets real personal. Number three, we're baptized because obedience transforms me. It's an internal component. I'm not saved because I'm baptized. I get baptized because that's already happened. It's an outward expression of what's already happened on the inside. It pictures the death and burial of Jesus and his resurrection as you come out of the water. That's the internal component. Here's the external. The external is because obedience is a witness to the world. Baptize a lot of people who said, man, that day when she got baptized, that day when he got baptized, that's when God spoke to me. Wasn't my sermon, wasn't anything but a testimony of obedience. This is why we're baptized. Jesus was, he commanded it. It transforms me to be more like him and my obedience to him, and it witnesses to the world around me today. So here's my hope for you. This is the hope of the series, that I have my doubts, but my doubts don't have me. I want to ask nobody to move. We're going to have a moment of response. So some of you need to accept Jesus. I'm going to give you a moment to to accept Jesus. And after that, we're going to have a time of baptism. Several are already scheduled. Some of you need to be baptized or at least commit to being baptized and talk to somebody about that today. But first things first, bow your heads, close your eyes. Don't miss this moment. We save plenty of time for it here. I want to challenge you right now. If you need to receive Jesus, say something like this. Say, Jesus, today I'm yours. I give you me. Will you forgive me and save me? I know you died for me. I know you rose from the dead. I believe. I confess with my mouth. I ask you to forgive me and save me. That's the posture of your heart. God wants you to know that you know that you know. And you can even take this next step of baptism even today if you're ready. In the New Testament, that's what they did. They went and found water. So I'm going to pray for you, and here's what's going to happen. I'm going to pray for you, and then I'll ask when I say amen, the counselors who are ready to speak with those ready to be baptized or take their next step, they're going to come forward. They're going to go to these doors to my right. 
And as they go to those doors, I'm gonna ask them, I'm gonna count to three, two groups of people to go and join them. Number one, those of you who are already scheduled for baptism. If you're under 18, we gotta talk to parents, so you know some of you have already been scheduled, but the second group is those who are ready to be baptized. And if you're under 18, bring a parent with you. But if you're not being with somebody, or it's gonna be crowded, I'm gonna tell you. I love it, I love a crowded baptism area. It's my favorite thing in this church is when the baptism area is so full. We saw 10 people baptized last service. And more is about to happen. Maybe God stirred in you that it's you. So I'm gonna pray. The counselors will come. And then the two groups, those who are already scheduled and then those who are ready to have that conversation, whether it's today or on a future date, will you come? God, thank you for salvation. The angels rejoice, so do we. So God, today, as I say amen, the counselors come and then I count to three and those other two groups come. We're gonna celebrate and then we're gonna baptize after we have a time of worship. We love you, we praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Will you stand your feet? All right, counselors, will you come right now? They're gonna come, they're ready to talk with you. You're gonna see them with name tags. They're gonna go to those doors, to my right, to your left. Counselors going to come, I'm gonna let you get there first. Counselors are coming, and then now I'm ready to count to three. Counselors are going over there. When I get to three, if you're scheduled for baptism, are you ready to step forward? You come right now. Ready, one, two, three, go to those doors. If you're scheduled, you're ready to take that step, you're ready to have that conversation. Let's encourage these people for being bold. Give God some praise for them. Yes, God is good, God is good. You can still come. We're gonna start to worship. Y'all keep it up, keep cheering for them. We're gonna start to worship. And listen, if you're still holding on to your seat and you need to join them, go. We'll meet you there. Will you come right now as we sing?
Thank you very much. What a great crowd to experience such a great moment as this. People following Christ and believers' baptism, something we get to experience uh, every week these days. And I'm so excited to see God's handiwork on a consistent basis. Uh, I want to ask uh, James to please come and join me. First, we have James Miller, and he has trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior some time back, but comes today to follow Christ and believers' baptism. And such an honor, James, to uh, get to talk to you this morning and and just be able to walk with you through some of this journey. And I know you have some friends here to uh, be a part of this celebration. He's part of the Rooks Life Group, and I want to ask them and any other friends of James, please stand right now as as uh, we prepare to baptize James. Amen. Amen. James, have you trusted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. Then it's upon that profession of faith and according to his great command that I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bear with Christ in baptism. Raised to walk with Christ in new life. That's all right. Come on, man. That's good. Good stuff. Is it afternoon yet, church? It is afternoon. Good afternoon, church. My name is Jimmy Garrett. I'm the kids pastor here, and I actually have my friends, my friend Caden. Come on in, Caden. This is Caden Strain. If you're a friend or a family member of Caden, go ahead and stand up for us. His parents are joining me today, and it's Corey and Nicole, right? Yes. I got it right. I was, I was messing it up in the back right there for a second. But Caden is so special, y'all. He's, he's known Jesus for a while now, but at, at Easter, he responded again. And, man, it was, what was it, two weeks ago, Caden? 
Caden is on fire for the Lord. And if you ever get a chance to talk to him, he's the way this boy prays, it's amazing. It's, it absolutely is. If you ever get a chance to uh, talk to Caden, please do. Caden, I've got a question for you, buddy. Have you asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. That's what's going to crush your arms for me, okay? Upon your profession of faith, we baptize you, our brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of Christ, and raised to walk in a new life. Woo! All right, now I have my friend Maddox. Maddox and Brian Preston will be uh, baptizing him. So, Maddox, come on in, buddy. If you are a friend or family member of Maddox Keaton, go ahead and stand up for us. Let's celebrate them being with us today. Awesome, awesome. Well, good afternoon, church. Uh, my name's Brian Preston. And uh, this is my good family friend, Maddox Keaton. Um, and I'm also his uh, small group leader. And I was thinking um, this morning that I was Maddox's age when I got baptized by Todd on this same campus a long, long time ago. And our Christian faith is such a beautiful, beautiful story. And Maddox, we are just so proud of you. Maddox is an incredible baseball player. In fact, yesterday they won the championship. Um, locally here. I think he ended uh, the season with a 470 batting average, which is really incredible. Yep. And they uh, actually brought home the championship. So, Max, we're so proud of you. I have a question. Are you ready to make Jesus your champion? All right. It's so because of that profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of Christ, raised the walk of the new life. Yeah, guys, we got a while to go. This is our, this is my friend Bailey Jones and her parents Bo and Brittany Jones. If you're a friend or a family member of Bailey, go ahead and stand up for us. Celebrate them being here, absolutely. Always a joy to stand with family. So Miss Brittany's going to take over from here. Go ahead, Bailey. I am so proud of you. Good job doing this. Bailey, have you accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? It is upon your public profession of faith I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. My name is Mallory Drake. I'm the elementary director here, and we get the honor and privilege of baptizing our fourth grade friend, Miss Charlie Marlowe. Come on, Charlie. If you're a friend or family member of Charlie, would you please stand? Wow, girl. All right. We're joined here with her dad, Casey, and her grandfather, Chris. Oh, I'm going to try a few, say, say a few words with them. She told me before I came up here not to cry, which is impossible, but uh, you're my best friend in the whole world. Um, I believe God put you in my life or on, on earth for two reasons. One is because you saved me from going down a really dark and destructive path. And uh, the other one is uh, we've, been, we've got a gift, and that's we never meet a stranger. We talk to everybody we know, and I think you can use that to um, lead people to the Lord. I just love you so much. A lot. And I'm so proud. Amen. You ready? Yeah. There, there's a lot of decisions you'll make for life, but this is the decision you make for never-ending life. We love you. We'll always be there with you. But now, Jesus will always be there with you everywhere. Ready? Okay. Charlie, have you accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. All right, it's upon your profession of faith that I baptize you, my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. All right. I could do this all day. 
I love it. I am so glad you guys are, are here. I want to invite. Guys, come on down. All right, who's next? Yep, okay, Miss Stacy's next. That's good. I love it. Miss Stacy, Stacy Chosewood. Yeah, friends or family of Stacy, will you stand? There they are. Look out, my friend. See you. Okay. <laughs> she said, I can't see, I don't have my glasses, but they're there, I promise. <laughs> Stacy, I'm so proud of you. you. Get to Caitlin is coming up next. Your friend is here. And so I know you guys go way back. Y'all wanted to do this together today. Have you trusted in Jesus as your Lord, Master, and Savior? Yes, sir. Go ahead, cross your arms. I praise God for you can hold your nose, absolutely. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. Because of your profession of faith in Jesus today, I get to baptize you as my sister today, Stacy, with your family and friends here. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk with Him in a new life. Yes. Amen. All right. You can hang right there and watch Miss Caitlin's baptism. This is Caitlin Williams with the friends and family of Caitlin Stan. Probably some of the same group because they're all family, aren't they? That's all right. Love it. Love it. You two are special. All right, Caitlin. I'm excited for you. You excited? Yes. You've been waiting for this, haven't you? I'm so excited. When did you trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior? A while back, huh? But today you're ready to make it public and declare it to your church family. Well, I'm proud of you. Your church is proud of you. Important question. Have you trusted in Jesus as the Lord, Master, and Savior of your life? Good. Cross your arms for me. Because of that, you sure can. <laughs> because of your profession of faith in Jesus today, I get to baptize you as my sister in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Married with Christ in baptism. Raised to one with Him in a new life. Yes. Yes. I love it. All right. Do we have Miss Alana next? Miss Alana Harden. If there are some friends and family of Alana's, will you stand? Let her know you're there. Yeah, we thank God for you. Come on down, Alana. Am I saying your name right? Elena. I'm sorry, I said it wrong. Elena. Elena, we are so proud of you. See your friends, your family out there. You've got a big family. <laughs> I love it. Elena, did you trust in Jesus as your Lord, Master, and Savior of your life? Because of your profession of faith in Him get to baptize you today as my sister. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to one with Him in a new life. Thank you. God, thank you. We praise God. Come on up, Terry. And hey, we're not done because there are some people who responded today. Many were scheduled, but we got some people that responded today. Many will be in the future, some right now. So Terry, come tell us about this next lady here. Megan Swalford, she was part of uh, the Young Married Life group from how many years ago? And if I can't talk, forgive me. It's just touching, very. But uh, Lori and I led a life group, and Megan and her husband Chase was part of it. And she has uh, accepted Jesus this morning as her personal Lord and Savior. Is that not right, Megan? Yes, sir. So, you know I'm proud, uh, and Lori has too. We love you, and Jesus loves you. So, so, because of your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, next we have Danny Bryant. Danny, you ready? Come on down here, my friend. Danny came forward today, friends. Give God some praise for that step in Danny's life. Yes. If you're a friend or family member of Danny's, would you stand? Let him see you out there. That's great. Yeah. Danny, when did you give your life to Jesus? Is that recent or today? It happened before, but again today. Again today. He nailed it down today, he said. His salvation. Yeah. Let's give God some praise for that huge step. We have a great group of counselors that they sat, and Danny sat with one back there and talked through salvation and baptism, and all things are new, Danny. And hey, my friend, let me tell you something. I'm proud of you. Thank you. A real man of God steps forward on a day like today and says, I declare Jesus as my Lord, Master, and Savior, and that's what you're doing today. So the most important question anybody could ever ask you, have you trusted in Jesus as your Lord, Master, and Savior in your life? 
Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Because you have my brother, I get to baptize you as a family member, as a brother, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to one with him in a new life. <laughs> Woo! Hey, you guys give God some praise in this place as Kyle comes to wrap us up. What a day in God's house. Incredible. We're going to give our uh, children's ministry a chance to exit real quick. Awesome. Well, church, today, uh, between this service and the last service, there was 20 people that stepped forward in baptism this morning. So God has certainly moved. Yeah, let's give him a hand for that. We're excited for the individuals that took that step, but for us, for the church that's, that's been baptized, this is a reminder every week of our baptism, of what God saved us from, what he delivered us from. So go and be encouraged today. We love you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.